Good afternoon and welcome to our October webinar, a collaborative presentation of the Federation for Children with Special Needs and the Recruitment Training and Support Center. My name is Janie Kreko and I am the Training and Support Specialist at RTSC. Our technical producers today are Renee Williams and John Sullivan. Today's webinar is Chapter 222, How Is It Going and What Still Needs to Be Done, presented by Michelle Scavangeli. Michelle is a staff attorney sponsored by Morgan Lewis and Brockius LLP for the Ed Law Project, an initiative of the, Child's, of the Children's Law Center of Massachusetts and the Committee for Public Council Services, Youth Advocacy and Children and Family Law Divisions. She works at Ed Law representing low-income court children, court-involved children in special education and school discipline matters. She trains court-appointed juvenile delinquency and child welfare attorneys in education ad advocacy and manages Ed Law's pro bono attorney panel. She has also been a special education surrogate parent. During the webinar, please type your questions in the toolbox and feel free to engage with other attendees. Past webinars are available on the RTSC website, along with many resources on educational issues that impact students in child welfare. Registration is now open for our fifth annual conference for special education surrogate parents, foster adoptive and kitchen pa kinship parents, and their professional partners. Again, visit our website for more information on exhibiting and registration. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. <coughs> and um, hello, everybody. And thank you um, for joining us. So I'm going to talk um, about Chapter 222, which was legislation that was passed back in 2012 and then didn't go into effect until July 1st of 2014. And the purpose of that legislation was to reduce exclusion of students from school, to increase the reporting that schools have to do about that exclusion, and to increase access to education for students while they're excluded from school. But before taking a look at uh, 222 and its effect, I need to, t I'm going to kind of bring us all to sort of a common base of knowledge and run through the school exclusion laws and within that I'll incorporate the changes that happened as a result of Chapter 222. So let's start by talking about um, semantics terminology. You'll hear people say, my child is being suspended, my child was excluded, you'll hear the words expulsion. These words can, in some sense, be used interchangeably because different schools, different principals um, might mean different things. But we think about school exclusion as just a general, and, and I almost use this term more, an overarching term for any punishment that will keep a student out of the classroom or out of school. Um, Suspension, I think of as something, uh, a short-term suspension being uh, 10 or fewer days. A long-term suspension would generally uh, last no more than 90 days, but it could be indefinite, as you'll see in certain cases. An expulsion is something lasting more than 90 days and can be permanent. So why is this so important? Well, it, the goal is to keep kids in class. And um, we know more and more and more about how important it, it is to keep students in school. When students are excluded, um, it, it's almost the reverse of what you want to happen. If, if a student is having trouble in school, kicking them out of school is often the last thing you want to do. Have them just sitting at home with no education, with no guidance. And there's been many studies that have shown that school exclusion is correlated with school truancy and school dropout. In fact, students that have been excluded um, even once are now three times more likely to actually drop out. And when students drop out from school, there's many studies that have shown that um, dropping out of school um, sadly increases the chances that that individual will end up involved in the criminal justice system. Um, being out of school um, 
contributes to a lack of appropriate social development. So even though a child can be at home perhaps making progress with online or occasional tutoring, they're not getting that interaction of working with adults and other students. Um, when students drop out, um, they get involved with the criminal justice system. They also may experience homelessness. Um, their ability to ha make a living wage is reduced. At the end of the day, excluding students from school has a cost to all of us as taxpayers. And I've seen that tax quantified as, in, in some cases, as close to over $200,000 um, for every student that's excluded from school. Um, in Massachusetts, so we have to go back a little bit before Chapter 222 went in effect and understand the climate that was in place prior to um, the real push among um, school and education advocates. If we look back to the year 2000, school year 2009 to 2010, um, there were over 60,000 dis disciplinary exclusions. So they could be in a suspension, an expulsion, or a student who was removed from one school and sent over to sort of the alternative school in town. Um, more than half of these exclusions were for general kinds of offenses that you might find in a school's um, handbook, code of conduct. They weren't for violent offenses, they weren't for criminal activity, they weren't for drugs. And that number was likely un underreported because there aren't meant strong reporting requirements. Until July of 2014, schools were only obligated to report exclusions um, on non-special ed students if they were out more than 10 days. We know that IDEA requires more significant reporting for students on an IEP. And what we see from this, and, and there was a real strength, a, a sense among, among advocates, that schools were using um, these unassigned offenses, um, they were being overused, um, and kids were out of school too often, and in many cases um, without any access to education. As a result, students during that school year missed nearly 200,000 school days, or that you could equi equate that to over a thousand years of school. And we'll see later, but it was certainly the case then, we'll see in the, in the current data this is still the case, although not as um, striking, students of color, students from low-income families, students for whom English is a second language, and students were, with disabilities were removed at disproportionately high rates. So that, that was the environment in which um, the um, advocacy for changing the laws came up in place. Now let me talk a little bit about what due process rights exist for, for students and families when the school is um, considering disciplining the student and perhaps removing them from school. So the burden of proof, people may have heard that term in criminal cases, it's more likely than not. So that's not beyond a shadow of a doubt or clear and conven convincing um, uh, evidence. It's just, you know, 51%, just kind of tip the scales um, a little bit over 50-50. Um, so that's the burden of proof that the school um, has to show in uh, taking a, an action to exclude a student. All hearings um, for exclusions, and we'll come back to this, where the student is going to be excluded for more than 10 days must be audio recorded. A lot of times people don't know this. I walk into, I represent students at um, uh, discipline hearings quite often. And many times I have to say, okay, who's recording this? And th the school knows, and there often could even be a school's attorney there, and we'll have to stop and get um, that hearing recorded. Because there are rights to appeal, so it's important to have a transcript of what's said at that hearing. There's two types of offenses that we're going to talk about for which students are disciplined. And there's three different due process schemes or procedure, if you will, for um, treating these offenses. 
Um, I'm going to talk about the serious offenses first and in terms of due process and in terms of what the scheme is um, for the discipline, that really didn't change under Chapter 222. What did change is the rights of students in all of these cases to access education if they're excluded. And then non-serious offenses, there were a lot of changes as to how discipline under those cases is treated under Chapter 222. Let me first talk about serious offenses. Serious offenses that can lead to school discipline fall into two categories, into two sections of the law. Under the Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 71, which deals with all matters relating to school, there's Section 37H and there's sec Section 37H and a half. Don't ask me why <laughs> it's H and a half, but, um, but that is the section that, that deals with this. So there's two different schemes for dealing with these kinds of um, exclusions. I'm going to first talk about Section 37H. This governs um, the ability of the principal, the authority of the principal to sus suspend or expel, there's the right to expel under this section, students for certain kind of offenses that occur on school premises or at school sponsored um, or related events. And you, you really have to think of it as sort of your big three. It's weapons, drugs, and assault on staff. So possessing weapons on school property or at a school event, possessing drugs on school property or at a school sponsored event, and assault, but the assault has to be on educational staff. So this wouldn't include fights between students, but a student uh, pushing a teacher or an administrator um, would fall under this category. So that's a 37H infraction. The decision maker um, is the principal. Um, and what's important to remember, and if, you, if you're ever in a situation with your own child or a student that you're advocating on behalf of, the principal is authorized to expel, permanently expel a student who commits one of those infractions. So they have a weapon at school, um, they're found with drugs at school, they've assaulted um, a teacher or other school official, but they're not obligated to. Um, sometimes principals will talk as if, well, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I kind of have to do this. They don't. They have discretion. There's no requirement for zero tolerance here. Um, these three offenses, again, weapons, drugs, assault on staff, plus felony adjudications or convictions, which I'll be talking about under 37H and a half, are the only situations, and bear this in mind, the only situations where the principal can permanently expel a student. So if you walk into a situation that's not one of those and people are talking about expulsion, well hopefully after today you'll be able to set them straight. Um, in the case of 37H, what process and procedure is required? So the student, their family are um, required to get notice, which has to be written and an opportunity to be heard. So um, the written notice um, is, is a letter um, that will come to the student and their family and informing them that they are going to have a hearing in front of the principal. Um, they should be told that they have the right to bring an attorney. Unlike um, in court for indigent families, an attorney is not going to be appointed for them at their own expense, but they can bring an attorney and organizations like the Ed Law Project that I work for and our contact information is at the end of this PowerPoint and other legal services organizations in Massachusetts for families um, with the right income requirements will often take these cases and represent students um, at the hearing. I was at two hearings last week as an example. Um, and the student and their family have the right to present evidence and witnesses. Um, they can, um, a lot of times I talk to families about bringing evidence of the student's character, people who will vouch for the student, evidence that they didn't do what they're being accused of, um, evidence of um, other reasons why they should be allowed to stay in school. Um, this in-person hearing is recorded and it's run by the principal. There often might be the 
dean of students or the assistant principal, whoever is responsible for discipline in the school. There may be individuals who were, if there was a particular situation, who were involved in that. And again, the family can bring their own witnesses. Um, after that hearing, it might be at the hearing or it might be a few days after, the family will get a notice from the school letting them know what the decision is, whether they're going to be allowed to come back to school. You kind of hope it would happen at the hearing, but they might hear, or whether the student is going to be excluded for a certain amount of time or, you know, unfortunately expelled. That can be appealed to the school superintendent. The family must request that appeal with the superintendent in writing within t 10 days of getting the notice that they're going, the student is going to be expelled. They can also appeal if it's even a shorter um, suspension but still long term. Um, students again can bring an attorney to the appeal hearing. Um, it says here appeals are de novo, which means they're going to have a new hearing all over again. It's not going to be just a review of whether the principal held a fine hearing. You're going to he get your chance to in front of the superintendent. And in many cases, it may be pro forma that the superintendent is just going to su support the principal. That might be particularly true in the types of schools where literally this the scope of authority of the principal and the superintendent are the same. We see that with um, charter schools, you see that with vocational schools as an example. However, it can be the case, and I've seen it, where maybe it doesn't make sense for the student to go back to that particular school, but the superintendent might sit over in a very large district and have at their, um, uh, you know, ready another place the student can go. They have a little more authority. They don't necessarily have to take the heat from parents at that other school. And so it is certainly worth um, pursuing the appeal. Um, after the, uh, oh, so let me, let me say what happens at, after that. After the appeal, um, the superintendent will notify the um, family whether they're going to uphold the um, expulsion or whether they're going to do something else. That can be appealed. It doesn't happen very often, but you can appeal to Superior Court. Um, I'm not going to go into too much. It's, it, the, the standard at Superior Court is that the decision of the principal and superintendent was arbitrary and capricious, so that's pretty hard to show but you can sometimes show it. I was successful in, in the one appeal I filed in Superior Court. You, you choose them, but you choose your cases. Let's talk about 37 H and a half real quickly. So this is the other type of infraction um, which grants the principal the authority to suspend or expel students. And this is the case in which a student picks up a delinquency charge that's at a felony it has has a felony equivalent in the uh, adult system. It can be any type of felony uh, complaint. For example, assault and battery with a dangerous weapon, and that could just be throwing your shoe at somebody. But that's a felony complaint. Um, it does it does not have to be um, something that happened at school. It could be something that happened in a different town over the summer, at night. Um, it, there is a lot of often sharing of information between, and many schools as we know have school resource officers who are connected to the police. So often even though um, the student has uh, picked up a felony charge for something that didn't even happen in school, schools will get wind of this and then they may choose to proceed under 37 H and a half. Um, there is guidance out there that was promulgated back in actually 1994 by uh, DESE, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, that tried to clarify for principals and superintendents what they had in mind when this um, law was put in place. And their guidance was that this was supposed to be 
meant only for the most serious of felonies. Um, cases of homicide or severe, um, you know, where there was severe violence or injury, rape. Um, but I think we've gotten, that was guidance and we've gotten fairly far away from that. But I often find it helpful if you're going to a hearing to try to bring that and remind the um, school uh, decision maker, whether it's the principal or the superintendent, that this was really meant for the most serious felonies. And it came about when um, a student picked up an extremely serious charge over the summer and the school complained that they had no way of keeping this student out of school who was charged with a serious crime. Now, I would argue if they weren't necessarily a threat to the school, was keeping them out of school, um, you know, the worst decision, I don't know. But certainly that was the backdrop for this, for this law and this category of infraction. Again, the principal is the decision maker and there's very specific language. In the case of 37H and a half, the principal has to make a determination that the student's continued presence in the school will have a substantially detrimental effect on the general welfare of the school. Um, and the hearing is all about that. But often, um, I think just the fact of the charge will lead a, might lead a principal to make that determination. And they have broad discretion. Um, when a student uh, picks up a felony complaint, so they haven't even gone through the court process, this all ultimately may be dismissed, it might be reduced to a misdemeanor, they might get pro probation, but while it's out there, um, the principal can suspend them indefinitely. And until it's resolved to be not a felony, the student can't come back to school. Um, if the student is, receives an adjudication um, or is convicted, admits guilt, they might receive uh, continued without an, a finding, but they actually, in that process, admitted guilt, um, they can be expelled. So that, there, there's a lot at stake. In terms of procedure, um, in the law, only notice is contemplated, so the pre principal really, you don't have to have a principal level hearing like you did in 37H. The principal theoretically could just write a letter saying the student has, the felon has a felony charge, they should identify it. Um, there was a recent case decided at the um, Supreme, the SJC, Supreme Judicial Court, where a school went forward when there actually wasn't a felony, they went forward on the belief there was, and it was held they can't do that. You have to be able to to know that the student has a felony to and have proof to be keeping them out of school. But the principal only need write a letter stating that the student has a felony charge and that the, the principal, he or she, has determined that the student's continued presence in the school would be a substantial detriment to the general welfare of the school. But what I've seen is most schools do provide for school level hearings and certainly always ask for one. Um, as with 37H, if the principal indefinitely suspends or expels a student, the student has the right to appeal this exclusion to the superintendent. In this case, um, they have to request the appeal within five days of, the dis of receiving the decision that they're excluded. The superintendent must hold the hearing within three days uh, of the request for the appeal and they have to render a decision within five days. Again, this can be appealed uh, to the Superior Court. So let's talk about Chapter 222 here. I'm going to flip back to that. So Chapter 37H, Chapter 37H and a half, those types of infractions, that law existed. Chapter 222, which was entitled An Act Relative to Students' Access to Educational Services and Exclusion from School, made important changes to student rights in disciplinary procedures. Um, and as I stated before, um, it was enacted in 2012. There was a two-year period to really allow schools to get ready for this. 
um, particularly in the area of having alternative education plans available um, for students, but then it went in effect on July 1st of 2014. And again, the goal was to reduce the use of exclusionary disciplinary practices. So we want to see less kids being excluded from school. Increasing due process protection. So you, you, there was a fair amount of due process protection in 37H and H and a half, but for exclusions under other basis, there wasn't a lot. And um, as you'll hear, pro at that point, um, two-thirds of the exclusions, or more than half of the exclusions, were not these violent or criminally based or illegal substance based exclusion, and also to improve um, school reporting requirements. So a new section, section 37 H and three quarters, <laughs> There must be a 37i because they're trying to fit them all in. Actually, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> but actually, uh, se section 37H and three quarters was added to the law on school discipline. So here's where you start to see some changes from chapter 222. And the regulations can be found at uh, 603 CMR 53, and those were, um, were codified. So what this section did was addressed non-serious offenses, things that weren't, didn't fall in the category of 37H or 37H and a half. So for example, fights between students, assuming that there's not, there wasn't a charge that resulted from a fight between students. Improper use of computers, bullying, harassment, um, you name it, all the other reasons for which students were being excluded. All the things that are in a district's code of conduct one of the things, just as a tip, that we always do when a family comes to us and a student comes and, and needs help in a discipline matter, one of the first places I go, I might know the law, but what I don't know is for that particular school district or school, what's, what's their code of conduct say? What does their student handbook say? So I want to take a look through that to see, are they treating my client the way they say they will treat a student for a certain offense. And often they should be using um, a practice of progressive discipline. The first time a student does something wrong, there's one consequence, and the consequences don't become very serious unless the, the, the pattern of behavior is repeated after supports have been put in place. Um, 37 H and 3 quarters also um, applies in terms of um, education uh, access and even though it's under 37 H and 3 quarters it applies to students who were um, excluded under 37 H or 37 H and a half but it was it was thrown into this section so for non-serious offenses you'll see there's suspensions and there's long-term suspensions there is no longer the ability to be expelled. The most, and I'll say this several times, other than 37H or 37H and a half, the most a student can be put out of school, and it's a lot, is 90 school days. So 37H and three quarters created this limit. It's cumulative, it's equivalent to half of a school year, and once that 90 is used, a student may not be excluded for the rest of the year for a non-serious offense. This is really important. Schools also do things often, we hear this from parents, where they'll call and they say, come pick up your child. Or they'll send a child home and they're not calling it an exclusion. Um, as a parent, you can push back and say, well, are you excluding my child? Do I have to come pick them up? Can't you support them? And if they're going to, document it and that should count because that's an exclusion. Um, what due process rights were created for these non-serious uh, offenses? First, um, notice, like we saw before in 37H and 37H and a half. This part of the law formalized the right to notice. Many school districts were very good and had, um, I think of Boston as an example, they have a you know, very clear notice requirement. They have a very clear uh, code of conduct with lots of different sections and families will get notice that really 
takes them right to the section and they understand why their student, what their student is being disciplined for. And the notice has to be provided to the parent and guardian. It has to include uh, the charges and the reason for the suspension or expulsion. And it has to be in English and in the language spoken at home. The due process also requires an opportunity to be heard. And again, this part of the new law formalized the right. So the student has to be given a chance to meet with the principal or the head of the school um, prior to being excluded, except in one case. And they get a chance to discuss what's going on and, you know, hopefully maybe tell their side of the story and work things out before they're actually excluded. It's ideal to have the parent present at the meeting so the parent can be there to hear what's going on, to support their, um, their child. And the only time they sh should not be at the meeting is if the school can't reach the parent after making reasonable efforts. And the school has to document their efforts to get in touch with the parent. So if you think about this, something goes wrong at school and it doesn't fall into a category that I'll talk about in a min minute but there, a category was created for something called emergency removals. This isn't an emergency removal situation so say I don't know a kid writes something inappropriate on the blackboard or says something inappropriate. They don't need to be removed from school but maybe the school wants there to be some consequence, wants there to be some discipline whatever that might be. Discipline does not always have to come in the form of um, a suspension. It could be in-school suspension. We'll talk about all the different ways that suspend, you know, um, uh, there could be some consequences to behavior. But so in that case, the school reaches out to the parent and has a meeting. Has the parent come in, sits down with the student, and, and has a discussion. Again, the principal has the discretion to exclude or not, and they're, and they're required actually to use this discretion. And they're required under the new law to consider ways to re-engage students in the learning process. Um, students don't have to be long-term suspended until other, they may not be long-term suspended until other non-exclusionary methods have been tried. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. For, the, for those of us who are parents or have watched kids, you don't always go to the most severe consequence. You, you want to make this a learning process. So uh, mediation, where you sit down, you try to work out something reasonable. If it's something between a student and another student or a student and teacher, perhaps say, having a conflict, res convening a conflict resolution session. Try to make things better just punishing both of the students and then they come back to school the conflict might still be there so this could be really positive many of us may have heard of restorative justice that's where all of the people involved in a particular situation come together in a circle and um, share how they're feeling share what went on and come up with solutions positive intervention and supports this is really important particularly kids with special needs um, their IEPs and I'll talk about this at the very end need to include um, beha positive behavior interventions and supports um, maybe a probationary period maybe detention you know you stay after school um, maybe coming to school on Saturday uh, a behavior contract uh, maybe they lose some privileges. They can't go to the school games or something. Um, if they've damaged something, maybe they fix that. In some way, make it up to the person who was harmed. So there are lots and lots of alternatives to exclusion. And this law makes it clear it wants schools and families to work together to explore these. Let me talk about emergency removals. So um, in some cases, and, and this is, when I talk about how's it going, this has been probably the area that's gotten a lot of focus. So this is a situation where, again, you don't have a um, infraction that would fall under 37H, um, weapons, drugs, or assault, or 37H and a half, felony complaints. But the school personnel, the principal, 
believes that the student needs to be immediately removed. Well, they can be removed without a prior hearing, but it can't exceed two school days, so you better get a hearing in uh, before two school days have, have gone by. But the requirements are pretty significant. It has to be a disciplinary ex offense, so something articulated that a student knows they can be disciplined for. And the continued presence of the, school, of the student at school poses a danger to persons or materially and substantially disrupts the order of the school. And in the principal's judgment, there is no alternative available to alleviate the danger or disruption. Um, and this has to be reevaluated on an ongoing basis. So it might be that there's a fight and there's a lot of commotion at a particular time, but there's no threats, hey, I'm going to finish this later or we're going to keep this going. It's just it happens, it ends. Maybe it's appropriate for that day to send home the students involved, but there's nothing that's saying continuing to have those students in the school is going to you know, is a problem. They should every day the student the principal has to be looking at this, um, and they have to be considering: is there another way? Could we separate people? Could the students stay in school, but maybe you know have an in-school suspension or work over? You know looking at many things and looking at the situation to say yeah I don't love what happened but there's not this continued problem and um, our organization uh, Greater Boston Legal Services documented many situations we were aware of where an emergency removal was conducted but it really didn't fall into this situation so I think we've looked to um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to provide more guidance around this issue of emergency rem removals. Um, and uh, the student also may not remove a student from school on an emergency basis until adequate provision have been made for the student's safety and transportation. So you can't just send a kid home. You have to make sure, it, based on the age of the child, they have a safe way to get home. They're not going to be home alone, you know. Um, and during the emergency removal period, um, the principal has to uh, quickly and reasonably notify the student, the student parents of the emergency removal, the reason and the need for it, uh, provide the opportunity for a hearing with the, the principal before the two, two school days is up, and render a decision on the same day as the hearing and in writing no later than the following school day around what is going to happen uh, for that particular infraction. Um, so what are due process rights under 37H and 3 quarters? Well there are appeal rights. So any student who has been excluded for more than 10 cumulative days can appeal to the superintendent. So this is the same as with 37H and H and a half. They have to request that within five days. They can be given an extension of, of an additional seven. Um, and then once requested, the appeal hearing must occur within three days. And again, there's an opportunity for a seven day extension. Um, and the superintendent um, in their appeal hearing has to include the parent or guardian and again the decision uh, must be rendered within five calendar days. It doesn't say this but of course parents can bring attorneys to both principal level hearings and superintendent hearings. A, a, a parent can always bring an attorney with them. There was a special consideration put into the law uh, for kids in, in grades kindergarten uh, through third grade. Um, special reporting, so if a principal is looking to exclude um, a student in anywhere from K to 3, they have to notify the superintendent that they're getting ready to do that in writing with the alleged misconduct and the reasoning for the out-of-school suspension. I think most of us have trouble understanding that you, you know, <laughs> why would you be suspending a student in K through three. Um, so I think to try to curb that, 
really having the principal have to go to this step. It lets the principal, the superintendent, see what's happening, and you, you hope that it makes people think twice and and realize what's going on. Michelle, sure. That includes public preschools also, does not does it not, or does that not identified in the law? Um, that's a good question. Okay. I can I can follow up. Um, I I am not aware of okay. that. Okay, um, because it you always be. hear about preschoolers being suspended, and and I wondered if the law hadn't actually addressed the preschool. Level. Right. Okay. I'll I'll take a look. Okay. And thank we you. We can follow up. Thank you. Um, so the biggest change, and this was huge. And it, it's codified in Section 37, H and three quarters. But as I said, it applies to all excluded students, no matter what reason they were excluded. They must have an opportunity to make academic progress. As somebody who's been working in this field before 222, it was really tough to have. Uh, I'd often meet clients after they'd been excluded, and you'd have kids as young as 11 and 12 who'd been expelled and there was no education being provided for them um, now um, under chapter 222 all students um, must be allowed to make academic progress um, they're allowed to make up work during the short periods of time that they're being excluded so um, and this applies whether they're excluded for one day or they're expelled. Um, and they have to be given the opportunity to make academic progress in the general uh, curriculum. They can make up assignments, their homework, quizzes, exams, papers, projects. Um, the four students who are being excluded for more than 10 consecutive days they need to have access to an alternative education plan. And schools, and I think that's why there was two years given before this law, one of the many reasons went into effect, schools needed to create a school-wide education service plan, and it's supposed to be in writing, documented to address these needs. Examples of ways students can still get their education are tutoring, alternative placement um, many districts do have a school have schools um, for kids who've been excluded it's usually the larger districts some school districts allow have classes on Saturday or night school um, there are online programs and distance learning I've seen resourceful parents cobble together tutoring along with an online program now remember this is for students in the general curriculum. Students on IEPs, um, I'm not going into that in this set in this session, but they have greater rights and they have to continue to receive FAPE while they're excluded. And that could mean placement at a uh, therapeutic school or depending on how significant um, the services they were receiving in school were. Um, so the school will provide a written list of options to the family and then the, the student with their parent um, can make um, a selection. The students should be provided with at least two options. So that's a, a broad view of the changes that of, of so hopefully you have a good sense of the state of school discipline and the laws that govern it. So what's happened since Chapter 222 um, went into effect? Well, uh, the good news is that the reported, the numbers of uh, disciplinary events, exclusions, will, as we'll see, are down. Um, there is now a focus on, and there's a, there's a lot more reporting and you can see this data, um, but there's a focus on districts with the highest percentage of exclusions. And the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, they're focusing on the schools that they perceive, certainly based on the numbers, are um, that have an excessive use of long-term suspensions. So this is suspensions um, greater than uh, 10 days and also schools that are uh, have disproportionate rates of um, discipline or exclusion for students with disabilities and or students of color and uh, 
low-income students and English language learners. Um, there's a, a great, um, there was a uh, news release, a press release from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. I've got the link here on your PowerPoint. Um, and they, they talk about which the schools they are and what they're trying to create is, I'm calling it learning communities. They may refer it to a learning network to try to pair schools with a similar kind of school um, that's having good success. So uh, charter schools, perhaps a charter school might complain, well, you, you can't compare me to um, a local uh, district school, a traditional school, or in certain districts. So DESE is actually pairing schools that are having good results with schools that are having not good results to hopefully have some learnings. There have been school districts that in the first year, so all of this was based on data for the school year 2014 to 2015. So that would have been the first full school year after Chapter 222 went in effect. So um, based on that data, there were some schools that cut their rates of discipline and exclusion in half. So they're doing some things that are working. And I think looking at those schools and pairing them with some other schools, um, I don't think this will surprise anybody, but only but five percent of all the schools in Massachusetts account for 42 percent of the disciplinary incidents. So it's what we always see, a small number account for um, the, the vast majority, almost almost half. Um, so, uh, you know, 98 schools, which is 5% of schools in Massachusetts, um, are, and all of these schools were disciplining more than 90 students in that one school year. Um, this initial group that DESE is focusing on is 25 schools in 18 district. Um, I can tell you that when you look at the data, and, and I urge you to go to this and another report that I'm going to talk about, um, the 20 schools with the highest rates of suspension are overwhelmingly alternative schools and therapeutic day schools. And I, I don't think that's good for anyone that's working in this field, that shouldn't be a surprise. But I think it does go to a little, especially for a, of us that work with children with special needs, the the still lack of understanding in you know how to support these students with their behavior um, that's out there if it, even in therapeutic schools we're seeing high rates of suspension um, the 50 highest suspending schools had rates of suspension from about 19 up to 74 um, percent within there there were eight charter schools 19 traditional schools and 23 alternative or therapeutic day schools. Um, the other thing that has happened since, as I mentioned earlier, there's really been a need to clarify when emergency removal, that, that category can be used, because there's a perception among advocates that it's certainly being overused. Um, this next slide, I'll, I'll walk through this, but this gives you a sense of the numbers. So if we look back to the school year 2012 to 2013, um, 900, almost 980,000. Uh, the, the enrollment numbers haven't changed too much, but uh, almost 55,000 students were disciplined, representing 5.6%. Um, the number of incidents um, from that number of students, you can see, was almost 130,000. So when you look at what is the repeat rate? Is it, you know, some students getting in trouble more than once? It was um, 2.4 um, incidents per student and over almost 210,000 days uh, missed. In the first year after Chapter 222, the number of students being disciplined is clearly down to uh, only just over 40,000. Um, a rate of discipline of 4.1%. Uh, the repeat rate is down, the number of incidents are down, and the number of days missed are down. Now there's an excellent, this data exists up, up you know, in the um, 
Department of Education uh, Education, the DESE websites, but for a great analysis of the data, uh, Mass Appleseed put together a report, uh, School Discipline in Massachusetts, how we're doing. They put it out in the spring of 2016. All my charts and numbers <laughs> that I've selected come from there. You can see the link. It's available as a PDF. I think you'll find it fascinating, and there's a lot more detail that I can, than what I can go into here. Let's um, drill a little bit more and look at discipline by student type. So here we, we see on the left in the top chart the discipline rates for all students, um, again declining from 5.6% down to 4.1%. But then you can see that there's declines across all categories of students, white students, black students, Latino students. Um, not SWD means not students with a disability, and then students with a disability. The bottom chart just continues it. English language learners, and you could compare them, their rates of discipline with students who are not English language le learners, um, students who are low income, and is that, that's as defined by qualifying for free or reduced lunch versus not low income. The definitions around low income change, the income definitions changed a little bit over that period, so it's a little uh, teeny bit misleading, um, but, it, but it's close. So I think you can see that while rates are down across all categories, still black students are being disciplined at three times the rate of white students and Latino students, you know, more than two times, almost three times. Students with a disability, um, you know, two and a half, almost three times that students without a disability. And if you do a lot of calculations, the gap um, between students without a disability and students with a disability is shrinking the slowest in that category. The gaps are going down amongst other categories, but in the, the category when we look at students with a disability, the gap isn't going down very much at all. Do they ever look at what kind of disability? Um, I, I don't believe right. so. I don't believe so. I think um, I've seen separate studies that have been done, and I'm, I can't recall who, where we look at students with an emotion, defined yes. as an emotional yes. disability. Yeah. I'm willing to bet that could be a large yeah. part of, of this group. Yeah. Um, I think one thing to think about is each of these is a category in and of itself, but think about the students that we all know who belong to more than one of these groups. Students of color who have a disability from a low-income family, their odds of being disciplined are astronomical compared to students. Mm -hmm. but, you know, so our most vulnerable kids are being disciplined at the highest rates. That's my takeaway from this. Um, this next chart I, I put out there, and I'll add some color, but this thing I'm calling Category 18 is, is just a a term based on the way the reporting data comes in and I take it right from the Mass Appleseed report but it's essentially a proxy for these nonviolent, non-criminal, non-drug offenses. So you can see they've gone from being 72% um, of all of um, the uh, out of uh, you know all of the um, the discipline to only 66 percent. So we're making progress on that category which is what the law sought, sought, um, sought to do. Um, however, um, just to drill in a little bit, in 2012 to 2013 black and Latino students made up um, two-thirds of the category 18 offenses. And the way to think about this is what we know is in situations where there's discretion, these are all discretionary. There's no, uh, there's no mandatory responses. We know that students of color um, are disciplined more frequently and more harshly versus when looking at discipline for behaviors, again, that, that trigger a mandatory response. So um, back in 2012, 2013, uh, black and Latino students 
were two-thirds of the out-of-school suspensions for Category 18 uh, offenses, whereas 52% um, uh, of white students were um, were uh, got out of school suspensions versus 48 percent got in school suspensions. If we look in 2014 to 2015, there's still a gap, but the disparity has gotten a little bit better. 58 percent of black and Latino students are getting out of school suspensions for category 18 kinds of offenses versus 48 percent for white students. So there's a, a lot more um, drill down you can see again if you take a look at the report. Um, the clarification, the suggestions made around emergency removals that I believe have been adopted, I, I apologize for not knowing that exactly, but I believe so, is that emergency removal should only happen if a student poses a danger to persons or property or materially and substantially disrupts the order of the school and when there's no alternative available to alleviate the danger or disruption. So this notice has to be individualized and it can't be used to circumvent due process. And the, you know, the principal, the disciplinarian at the school has to revisit this continually. Um, I'm going to end on this note, and I hope I've left, um, I've left five minutes, I apologize. <laughs> um, I just say to everyone out there, particularly if you're working with a student who's on an IEP or a 504 plan, it is really important to know these rules, but you know, if they are being excluded for more than 10 days, they are entitled to a manifestation determination review. And at the end of the day, I think that's the most powerful tool we have. Those can be appealed. Um, they can be appealed to the Bureau of Special Education Appeals. And often, that could be a better route to go. I mean, you, you might want to proceed with all the appeals you have through the disciplinary process, but this is where you're really working with people who understand students with a disability. There's also a new OSEP guidance document out there on behavior and discipline that has a requirement for behavior supports. I think when you're sitting in IEP meetings and you're working with students with emotional disabilities who you can see from their record, they're getting disciplined, this really talks about the obligation of teams to not to be trying to prevent that by putting a lot of supports in. It could be a webinar in and of itself, but I, I, this letter came out on August 1st, so I direct anybody to that. So here's our contact information. We have a helpline. Please, please feel, feel free to call with any questions, and you can also go to our website. So any questions? Okay, so uh, we have had a few come in, um, and if there's a broken link, um, the, uh, one of our uh, attendees is saying the link to the DOE um, uh, press release is broken, now, and that doesn't surprise me. They update it all the time, but okay. um, we'll take a look at that, Anne, and I'll, and I'll um, uh, email you about that. Um, but um, I think we, we have had a couple of questions around kids on IEPs um, and I think again this is this is not particularly for those kids but one of them um, was in, of interest to me to me because it comes up quite a bit and since you're here I'm going to ask okay. you <laughs> sure, sure. Um, can you put on the IEP that a student with a disability um, uh, is exempt from a particular part of the code of conduct um, I have heard that that is not gonna fly um, but you may know differently well I I mean IEPs are individualized yep. and every school district out there um, is going to approach things different yep. ways I think I would get at what part of the code of conduct and what is the concern and is it better to be understanding what supports they need mm -hmm. so that that part of the code of conduct is not coming into play. Yeah. So without knowing the specifics, I would point the person again to the OSEP document okay. and you know look at what part of the code of conduct there um, the student is running into an issue with, 
then there's something wrong. This, the IEP is missing something mm -hmm. because that student isn't receiving FAPE if they're constantly being suspended, being suspended right. or, or being pulled out of class. So there, you know, maybe there's a need for an FBA. Maybe you need an independent mm -hmm. FBA. Get a BCBA in from outside and take a look at what's happening mm -hmm. and say what has to happen with that student's yes. program. Yeah. Because, and, and I know um, for a lot of students, I've seen schools be willing to put in things that allow students, you know, mo maybe most students can't have a phone, but they'll let a mm -hmm. student who's having an anxiety attack call a parent yes. or, you know, so IEPs are only limited by the creativity of the advocate and the yeah. willingness of the school. Yes. Yep. But if it is something that's allowing the student to make progress, mm -hmm. um, but I would kind of go beyond just exempting them from yep. the code of conduct yep. because it sounds like perhaps there's a behavior that's not helpful to them, again, without right. knowing what right. it is. Yep. Um, and one of the other questions uh, that came through, um, I, I kind of v was very interested f with the emergency removals mm -hmm. that they have to make sure that the kids are um, safe at home or safe to get home. Um, right. So um, Faith actually asked, Faith Morgan asked, um, what if you've got a, a teenage kid who is in a state, as she said, um, and is sent home? Um, and goes home without a parent. Mm -hmm. um, is that the school's responsibility? Well, I mean, is there an age beyond which they say you're on your own? I don't believe that the regulations, at least relative to this, have a particular age. I think it's written so that if there's a student that they believe um, it would be unsafe to have mm -hmm. them not supported by adults. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't be sending them home. Okay. They should I agree. hold them at the school with the school nurse, get a hold of the parent, mm -hmm. certainly allow the student to be calmed down and, you know, um, I, I think, you know, if a situation arises, then it's going to be, yeah. you know, um, a situation to discuss with the school. But I think the spirit is to keep the child yeah. safe. and. I know I, you know, I have a teenager at home. I'm not leaving if she's right. <laughs> hysterical, as right, old as she right. is, and can stay alone herself. Yeah. If she's upset, yeah. you, you're think, not leaving her. Right. And I think that there's a there's a referral here to the uh, therapeutic dismissal that a lot of schools use, um, and they're actually emergency removals. Um, yes. And that there has to be some kind of safety plan in, in effect if those happen. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think there's a lot of things that happen, and that's one of the concerns. The numbers are certainly down. I think many of us believe that the numbers are still under-reported because there's many times kids are either being sent home yes. or parents are being called mm -hmm. and it's not being counted. I think if you have situations also where kids are being sent home and it's not safe, I mean, that's a good complaint for PQA in my mind yeah. and have them look at what the school's doing because yeah. they're going to be the ones enforcing um, these kinds of regulations. Yep. Yeah. And a question, a personal question that I had come through on my helpline. Um, someone, uh, an SESP, had a student who um, has uh, was in the process of being made eligible um, for special education. Um, had a manifestation determination review and was uh, deemed. Uh, it was deemed that the behavior was. He was. Uh, it was not a determination of his. I mean, a not a manifestation. Man, not a manifestation okay. of his disability. So what happened is it kicked in that he had to go through Chapter 222 disciplinary. Is that generally what happens? Well, um, so he had to go to another disciplinary meeting, appeals and all that kind of stuff. And that's um, usually, that should be the order. Okay. I'm very suspicious when a, a discipline hearing is held and then we do a manifestation. Right. You really right. should hold the manifestation determination review first. Mm -hmm. I would say for students who are going through the process, and it, again, everything depends on the individual situation, we often try to convince the school to not do it until we've actually finished the testing, we found, the, you know, hopefully found the child eligible, and we have a good definition of what their disability right. is. That was an issue. Because I don't know how you do a manifestation where you say, is the behavior 
substantially or directly related to their disability and you don't know what disability you're talking about. And so that would be something they could appeal to the BSEA. Yeah. Certainly. So we're, we, we're having a bunch of uh, questions coming in now. I don't know if we want to um, have them answered online um, or if people want to stay on. We still have a, a pretty large number of people on board. Um, I can, can stay can for you a while. Can you stay? Is, want, it, is it okay with our technical crew? Okay. We're saying, they're saying five minutes, so it'll be real quick. <laughs> okay. Um, so <laughs> um, this is an interesting one about a, um, a student who was charged with fire setting. Um, and then had it in one school district, and then was moved to a new uh, moved to a new school district, and the new school district wants to have a 37 h and a half meeting. Now, can you do that several times? Yes. You can. Okay. Yes. Each right. school district can do it. Okay, that I did not know. And right. And the th the thing that's important for people to know about that is sometimes certain schools I recently had um, a student I was working with who was at a vocational school and had a 37 H and a half uh, hearing and at one point they said to the family well because it was a vocational school you could withdraw you know and we won't move forward this won't be in your record and you could go enroll in your local high school and I said to them there's nothing that will that saying that your local high school isn't going to find out that you have this charge. Mm -hmm. You know, the student had a, a pending charge, and they could you could be back to square one with a school that actually doesn't even know you. Whereas at least the school we were dealing with knew the student, knew that it wasn't it was not typical of them that they were a, a good student and in fact they let them back into they ultimately let them back mm -hmm. into school mm -hmm. so but yes it can a lot because a lot of times parents will try that they'll try to move now there are some school districts some of the bigger school districts that um, I mean for years Boston for example that will never exclude any they really yeah. don't exclude yeah. a student they will be some type of education but many school districts, um, when there's a felony charge, mm -hmm. either was adjudicated or pending, will exclude them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they can do that. Okay. Um, just a quick question about, um, uh, do, you, do you, have you seen where due process is at odds with alternative processes like restorative justice? Which is an interesting question. So if, if restorative justice is in place and um, there's a, a response by the restorative justice circle, mm -hmm. um, can the school, I guess, um, go ahead and do the due process um, appeals and all that kind of stuff? Or does it over, does restorative justice, I, w I would think. I mean, I think if, if to, to enter into the restorative justice process, there's usually an agreement With between the student, yeah. the family, and the school that yeah. we're going to go down this road. Yeah. And it's usually not as punitive. I think the only times and we're associated with the public defender's office that I that you get at all concerned about restorative justice is say it's something that happens at school that could lead to charges being brought and is mm -hmm. information revealed in that process yes. that will be harmful to the student within a court setting but other than that I wouldn't you know, if they have a particular example or a particular question, they can certainly always call okay. our helpline. Okay, that's great. Um, and then lastly, um, and we get this all the time uh, for, from SESPs, can a manifestation determination review be held without a parent? No. I did not think so. So um, they, they can if there's a great amount of work trying to get a hold of them, right? Is it the same as an IEP meeting? Well, it's the same as a team meeting. Yeah, that's what so, I So, um, I mean, they should be working very hard to include the parent yeah. and, do you know, even if it's, you know, by phone. Yeah. Uh, it's usually, I mean, I, again, you have to, the parent is, is a required member. Yeah of the team yeah. or the person with education decision making right. rights is a right. required member of the team yeah. so I will I can give you a link to um, Mar uh, myself and Marley Spaniard our director I think it was maybe two three years ago we did a webinar on manifestation determination I reviews. think you did it here 
We, well, <laughs> we did it from our offices, but we did yes. it through you guys. I don't know if that's archived. It is we, archived. We also wrote yep. um, a law review article that's v very practical. Like you could, you don't have to be a lawyer to read it. Um, I can send you the link Excellent. to that if people would like to read that. A lot of yes. answers a lot of these yes. questions in terms of tips and strategy mm -hmm. and whatever. Okay. Great. All right, and if you could just uh, go forward, I think I have a couple of my slides here. So that's our that's our um, conference coming up. So please, if you're interested, and Marlies will be at our conference doing a uh, workshop on the new uh, Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, and please go and sign up um, or register if you would like to come. And then our last slide is just um, thank you for attending, and you will be getting a survey monkey in the uh, mail if you if you did attend, just through quick questions. So. Thank you, everybody, for attending, and thank you so much, Michelle. It was wonderful. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you.